Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today I'm at 17 Wing taking a look at something you probably wouldn't associate with the military. This is known as an Atmos clock, and it's manufactured by the Swiss clock and watchmaker Jaeger Le Coutre. This particular example was given in 1964 as a gift to Air Marshal Wilfred Curtis. Now, Curtis was a World War I flying ace with 10 confirmed victories flying a Sopwith Camel, and from 1947 to 1953, he served as Chief of Air Staff for the RCAF. And during this period, he was instrumental in the RCAF adopting jet aircraft. So not only did he arrange for the RCF to adopt the F-86 Sabre and to send a division of Sabres to Germany as part of Canada's commitment to NATO, but he also encouraged Canadian aviation industry to create a jet fighter aircraft of its own, including the CF-100 Canuck and the famous Avro Aero. He later served as vice president of Hawker Siddeley Canada, and it is that company that gave him this clock. So that's just some backstories, the provenance of this particular clock, but what's most interesting is how the clock itself works. The Atmos clock does not require any manual winding because it is continuously rewound by changes in atmospheric pressure and temperature. Now, clocks of this type go back to at least the early 1600s, with one of the earliest known examples being built by Dutch inventor Cornelius Drebbel, who is probably best known for building the world's first navigable submarine, which he demonstrated in the Thames in 1620. Now, Drebbel built a couple of these atmospheric clocks, uh, some of which were given to royalty, including King James I or King James VI, depending on whether you're talking about uh, England or Scotland, and Rudolf II of Bohemia. Now, in the 18th century, several other inventors would come up with versions of this same mechanism, including James Cox in the 1760s. And Cox's timepiece, as it was known, was touted as being an example of a perpetual motion machine. Now, of course, this is nonsense. Uh, it does indeed have an external power source, which is atmospheric pressure and temperature, which can trace all the way to the sun. So technically it's solar powered, or if you, you know, really want to get into it, fusion powered. And indeed, claims that clocks such as the uh, Beverly clock in New Zealand have never been wound also need to be taken with a grain of salt. The Beverly clock itself uh, was installed in 1864, and it has been stopped for maintenance and cleaning and to move it to different places over the years. But it hasn't been wound because once that maintenance is finished, the clock can just be left alone, and then you know, sufficient number of changes in atmospheric pressure and temperature will gradually rewind the clock and it'll start going again. So the mechanism that powers this particular clock was invented in 1928 by French engineer Jean-Léon Reuter, and the clock itself was first produced by the Compagnie Générale des Radios starting in 1929. Reuter's original version became retroactively known as the Atmos Zero, whereas the Compagnie Générale des Radios version became known as the Atmos One. The design was updated further in 1935 when production was taken over by the Swiss company Jaeger Le Coutre, and the Atmos II has been the most commonly produced variant ever since. And since 1935, over half a million have been produced. Now let's come in a little bit closer and I'll show you exactly how this works. So unfortunately, the driving mechanism of this particular clock is hidden behind this brass canister. But inside is a metal bellows-like capsule full of ethyl chloride vapor. Now, just like the methylene chloride I talked about in my video on Christmas bubble lights and the little drinking bird toy, ethyl chloride has a high coefficient of thermal expansion, meaning that it will expand and contract by a significant amount for you know, a certain change in temperature or atmospheric pressure in this case. Now, that capsule is retained by an extension spring, and it is attached to a tiny chain that you can see coming out of the capsule and wrapping around a pulley which has a ratchet mechanism attached to the mainspring. So whenever the pressure drops or the temperature rises, that bellows expands and it backs off the chain. And then when the temperature falls or the pressure rises again, it contracts under the action of the extension spring, and that pulls the chain and turns the ratchet, which then winds up the mainspring. And then the rest of it is just a simple mechanical clock. 
So as you can imagine, uh, changes in atmospheric pressure and temperature does not provide a whole lot of energy. So the clock mechanism has to be built and balanced very delicately in order to consume as little energy as possible. And this is why the clock uses a torsion pendulum instead of a regular swinging pendulum. Now the pendulum is suspended by an extremely fine wire made of an alloy known as Elinvar, which is composed of iron, nickel, and chromium. And Elinvar is a contraction of the French uh, elasticité invariable, invariable elasticity, which refers to the fact that it's specially formulated so that its elasticity doesn't change much with uh, changes in temperature, allowing the pendulum to keep a very regular period of one minute. So 30 seconds in one direction and 30 seconds in the other. Unfortunately, this makes the whole mechanism so delicate that there's actually a locking lever at the front here, which you have to lock to hold the whole mechanism still in order to move this. Like even if you want to move it across the table, uh, if you don't lock it first, you could seriously damage the mechanism. Now, the mechanism is so delicate and well balanced that it consumes only about 25 microwatts of energy. And according to the company's promotional material, a change in atmospheric pressure of three millimeters of mercury or a change in temperature of only a single degree Celsius is enough to power this clock for two whole days. Uh, they also claim that this can run for something like 300 years without maintenance, but really you're looking at more like 20 or 30 years without maintenance before something breaks or wears down. But still rather impressive and just a, a neat piece of showcase technology, if a bit impractical. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Uh, this is not really military related, like I said, other than uh, who it was given to. But I just thought that this is a neat piece of technology uh, with a very long history, and I thought it was worth pulling it out to show you. So there will be more from the 17 Wing Collection coming up later on. Uh, please stay tuned for that. Again, a huge shout out to the Heritage staff here for arranging for me to poke through their collection and have a look at all these interesting objects that I get to show you. Uh, until next time, I'm Jim Nessier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.